Amen. And good morning. And I hope you had a blessed Thanksgiving. I know uh, we've all been powerfully blessed in one way or, the, or another, but uh, uh, this Thursday which was particularly uh, joyous here. We had a hundred some people gathering together and uh, lots of uh, connection, lots of family, lots of, uh, of uh, delicious food, of course, but more delicious than that was delicious conversations and, and relationships. It is not good for man to be alone. It's not good for woman to be alone either. It is not good to be alone. It is not good to be alone. Don't seek to be alone. If you find yourself alone, spend that time in prayer, in God's word, in, in the scriptures, and then seek to build a relationship with somebody. Always go back and seek to build a relationship. Grow a relationship. Find a new relationship. We have some here who, who are particularly joyous at meeting strangers. And uh, one, one member here enjoys telling me, he said, I, uh, I like to meet strangers. And I say, hello. And they say, I don't know you. And he says, I know. Let's fix that. What a great way to approach people. I don't know you. I know. Let's fix it. Let's get to know each other. Today we're going to be in, in 1 Peter and, and uh, jump over to Titus for a little bit. We want to, we want to get God's guidance on the, on the uh, strengthening and the workings of our lives. We know, uh, because Scripture tells us to, that, that God is trying to make us like his Son. Think about that. Your goal in your walk in Christ is to cooperate with God to become like his son. To think like him. To talk like him. To respond to people like him. To love like him. To serve like him. To show loyalty, to show self-sacrifice like he showed it. We sang a song a little while ago, Each Step I Take. Each Step I Take, and it was a song calling on Christ's help for us. And, and in, our, in one of our songs we, say, we sang, Lord, do what you have to do, whatever you need to do. Do that to me so that I can be a servant like you. Do you mean it? Um, uh, do I mean it? Lord, do anything you have to do to me to make me a useful servant to you. Well, I'll give you the, my preference, Christ. I'd like to have health. I'd like to have a comfort. I'd like to have friends. I'd like to be out of prison. I got a list. But what if it's better if I suffer in a painful disease for years? What if it's better if I go through some great tragedy in my life, a disabling accident? What if, what if it's better for God that I uh, go into poverty, deep, suffering, friendless poverty. Do we mean it when we say, Lord, do whatever you need to do to make me like you? What we don't see, what we don't think about enough is how short this life is and how long eternity is. We have an awesome promise in Christ to have eternal joy, eternal blessing, eternal comfort with our Heavenly Father. And we 
don't even want, we're not even satisfied in sitting in an uncomfortable chair for very long, you know? Don't make me stand here. Can I sit down somewhere? We're not even, we're not even willing to go through a little bit of discomfort before. Ah. Let's pray. We need it. Heavenly Father, please help us to understand the joy found in Christ. Please help us to learn from you the, the lessons taught in suffering. Please help us to learn the victory found in defeating our desires and defeating sin in our lives. Lord, help us to be like Christ. Help us to follow your word and help us as we get into this lesson today to learn what you need to teach us in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Each step I take, back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, Peter writes this letter. This letter is not written to a church. If you want to flip to chapter 1, verse 1. To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So, Peter is writing to Christians across a great span of territory. He is absolutely intending this letter to be copied over and over and over again and sent out to congregation after congregation after congregation. He knows the Holy Spirit is giving him, him these words. He knows the person of Christ. He walked with Christ. He suffered with Christ. He denied Christ and wept over it. And he has been suffering every day since he did that. Every day since Peter did that, he's been suffering. How do I know that? How do you know Peter suffered every day since he denied Jesus to the end of his life? What was the signal that he had denied Christ? What did Christ say? The cock would crow. The rooster would crow. How many small villages and towns have roosters? All of them. All of them. And every day, he's going to hear the crowing of a rooster and be reminded that he denied his Lord. Every day, he's going to be invigorated to sharpen his life. So when Peter writes this, and listen to these words. To sum up, all of you be harmonious. I'm reading from the New American Standard, uh, as most of you realize. All of you, and he's remember, he's writing across all of Asia Minor, all of Bithynia. He's writing to hundreds, I shouldn't say hundreds, but scores of churches, little congregations, groups of Christians out there. Uh, by this time, there were not hundreds of, of congregations up there. But he's writing to Christians he'll have never met. And he says, all of you, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted. Peter is giving them a priority in their life, and that's to relationships. There's nothing more important than people. Starting with yourself, by the way. You are precious, priceless, and critical to the functioning of your family, of this congregation. You're critical to your friends' lives. Don't ever listen to Satan's lies that you're not important, that nobody cares about you, that, that nobody likes you. Don't listen to those lies. You are loved, you are priceless, and you are preciously important. You are vital. God says he puts us in his church as he needs us, as he desires us. You have a place, you have a purpose, you have a goal, you have work to do that he has already created in the past for you to do. But he's asking us, first he's asking us to build close relationships. We are being taught put my device down there so it wouldn't be distracting to me. We are being taught 
by our, by our electronic devices how not to have personal relationships with people around us. We are being taught and rewarded to go after electronic relationships. Now they're real people on the other end of it mostly. Um, electronic relationships rather than communicate and talk to somebody face to face who's real. If anybody's playing a game right now or involved in some other conversation, just stop for a minute. I'm not gonna say that you're not doing something important. I don't know if you're conversing with somebody who might be in the hospital or might be suffering from something very serious right now. So I'm not gonna be uh, critical of any electronic use. But know that the connection of conversation with a human being is what God intends us to be good at. He wants you to be an expert in relationships. He wants you to be really good at connecting with another human, connecting with their cares, connecting with their heart, connecting with their, their interests, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. To be an expert at building up and connecting with another person. You've heard me say this before. Don't tell your children not to talk to strangers. Show your children how to talk to strangers. Go out there and talk to strangers. Please. Please talk to strangers. It's what Christ did, and your children need to learn how to do that. Your children need to learn how to do that. I said hi to a family in a, in a shopping store about a month ago, two cute little boys with a lady, and she's all carrying a bunch of stuff and pushing a cart and juggling whatever she has to juggle, and both little boys, when I think one of the boys was looking at me and I said hi, both of them ran up to me and hugged one of my legs. And so I'm standing here with these two little guys hugging my legs, and so I patted their back, and their mom had this kind of crooked smile on her face going, oh, it's not exactly the way I want them to act, but, but it, they're sweet. And I said, they are very sweet. They are very sweet. And I introduced myself, and I invited them all here to join us uh, at the Valley Church. But be connecting Practice in here. We need it. We have to have it. It is life or death in here. We've talked about this before. But look at the other side of this. Verse 9, 1 Peter 3, verse 9. Not returning evil for evil or insult or insult. In our society is, is fine-tuning its revenge capabilities. People are getting really good and we're practice, and people are practicing how to insult in more and deeper cutting ways. Movie after movie after movie are revenge movies. Even children's cartoons end up being revenge movie. The bad guy does something wrong at the beginning and the rest of the movie is everybody chasing him down to get revenge on him. Revenge movies, when in, in fact Christ and God teaches us over and over, do not seek revenge. When someone harms you, hurts you, reviles you, steals from you, you bless them. You bless them. Do not give evil for evil, insult for insult, but instead give a blessing. For you, get your pen out, and underline this one. Hope you don't have an electronic Bible. For you were called for this very purpose. You were called to bring blessings into people who, who specialize in hurting folks. Now, I don't mean people out there being mean to everybody. I just mean this world practices hurting people. And you're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get more hurt by your loved ones and friends and fellow church members than you will by folks outside because we're more vulnerable in here, we're more vulnerable in our families, and we expect 
to be given love and care by them. And so when somebody close to you hurts you, it stings a lot more. But don't pull away. Don't pull away. Seek reconciliation. Bring a blessing into that relationship when somebody else brings some hurt in a relationship. So go out and practice blessing people. The end of it all is blessing you. You were called to this very purpose that you might receive a blessing. Right down in the margin, Luke 6, Luke 6, 31 through 35. Thirty-five reads, if you love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, your, your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. You want to be like the Son of God? You want to be called sons of the Most High? Then bring kindness in amongst evil. Bring consideration and blessings into somebody's hurtfulness. And then he says, this is a quotation in 1 Peter 3, this is a quotation from uh, Psalm 34. The one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil. Consider garbage words. Consider garbage talk. One uh, uh, direction that our, our society is going is to become more and more crude. More and more crude. It hit me right in the face about 15 years ago. I was in one of our big stores over here and the, and the greeting cards, the friendly and kind greeting cards had some guy turned around with his, the belt of his pants partway down his rear end and, and then it had ha ha something about something or something, something, something. Sorry to even describe it to you. But this was supposed to be funny. This wasn't in the off color store with, where you know you don't even want to begin to read those cards because they're, they start out being crude. This was mainstream and it's gotten worse and worse and worse so that words creep into our, our vocabulary that we should not be saying. Cuss words are cuss words because they describe crude things or private things that should not be mentioned in public. And the substitution words are just substitutions for rude things or crude things or private things that should not be mentioned in public. And on our lips, those things shouldn't be found. We should bring blessings and our words should bring kindness. Our words should bring consideration. Keep our tongues from evil. Foul words, uh, complaining words, harmful uh, criticisms, hurtful statements. His lips from speaking deceit Get rid of lies, get rid of exaggerations, extreme. Many times exaggerations can be innocent, but really we're practicing saying things that aren't true. So we should get rid of, 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 of exaggeration, we should get rid of bragging, we should get rid of lying. For he must turn away from evil, verse 11, and do good. He must seek peace. How do you seek peace? Seek peace in relationships. But Christ promises us peace. Christ promises us true peace. He creates peace between us and our Heavenly Father. And from that should cascade all other peace. You should be at peace with your own life. You should be at peace with your own self. And in Christ, you have that. If you'll just go get it. Let go of the, of the grabbing onto this world, of the, the discontent with where you are. Be content. 
Contentedness is taught to us in Christ. Be humble. Humility is taught to us by the cross itself. Be calm. Get rid of anger. Repent of, of unrighteous or selfish anger. The only kind of anger we ought to ever participate in is godly anger, where we're angry that somebody else is being hurt. We're angry that some wrong is being done. We're angry that something godly is being treated as ungodly or unholy. And godly anger always has a solution. Godly anger always has a, a helpful conclusion. Godly anger always has a purpose and a direction to go. Selfish anger is just about what I didn't get, about you cutting me off in traffic, about my, you know, bank account not being what it ought, I know, whatever it is. Pursue peace. Pursue peace and bring your peaceful life into other people's lives. Verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's where this comes from. We read this verse out of context a lot, and it fits out of context, but look where it fits in context. Do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness, with gentleness and reverence. We like to talk about uh, confidence in our faith, confidence in, in God's existence, confidence in the creation, but we're not doing that to win arguments. We're not, we're not studying doctrine from the scriptures so that we can win arguments against people. We're trying to win people, not arguments. There's another person on the other side of this conversation when you're talking about what the word says or about whether, whether God exists or not. You're trying to win the person and their heart and their trust. That's why this is, even when, we're, when we present defense, when we present our apologia, our apologetics, we do it with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will, that you should suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. A chapter before this, in chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, we read these words. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Your lives, we've talked in the past about how your marriages are not for your happiness. They can result wonderfully in your own happiness. But the point of our marriages is to bring glory to God, to show God's serving love between two people, to show God's loyalty and God's purpose in our families and in our lives, to show security to our children. And out of that, we'll get a lot of joy. But don't go into your marriage or look to improve your marriage to increase your own joy. You'll set it off in a whatever strange direction. Look to build your marriage to give glory to God. And in your life, notice, both in, in chapter 3, verse 16, and in chapter 2, verse 12, your life is to be lived to show God to the people around you. They might criticize you. They might revile you. They might slander you, according to these scriptures. But then the shame is on them. Then the shame is on them. You see this pathway we're being asked to walk is a pathway that works on our inner heart, our inner drive, which produces these actions, whether it's uh, the, the, the relationship work, 
being people who really care about people, who work on relationships, who work on caring and connecting with people, whether it's uh, uh, keeping our, our, our conversation away from garbage and on to encouraging talk, whether it's blessing those who hurt us, whether it's uh, turning away from evil and doing good, all of these things will result in joy in our lives, but the point is God wants to use all of that for his glory. And then we'll be clean. Remember Jesus uh, a rebuke about how the outside of the cup was clean, but the inside of the cup was filthy. God is showing us how to start cleaning from the inside of the cup and working our way out. From our motivation and our connection with Christ in our heart, in our faith, in our spirit, in our soul, and working our way out so that our actions truly reveal who we are in Christ. Oh, would we that we were as good as this list? But in fact, he has a walk for us to walk. Each step I take. This modern world, people are being embarrassed all over the place by ugly and harmful and hurtful behavior. People who have been using people, harming people, one day after another, after another, after another in our news, people who are seriously hurting people are thrown across the front page of our news. Some of them may not be doing anything wrong and may be innocent victims, but mostly you hear about very harmful and hurtful things. We're to live such good lives, such good lives, that when people see us in our natural state as who we are, they say, wow, I want to know more about God. I want to know more about your faith. Our lives are to be lived in front of other people, close to other people, loving and serving other people, connected to other people. So that even when they slander us, even when they hurt us, God will be glorified. And we'll stand. And we'll keep standing. Because we're not going anywhere. Because Christ is our strength. And Christ is our purpose. And Christ is our glory. Christ is our unity. Christ is our example. For Christ is our Lord. If there's any here this morning who... Uh, wish to make something known to the congregation that we can pray for, we can help you with. Or if there's any here today who have not been baptized into Christ, if your faith is ready and your obedience is ready, we'd like to help you with that. Whatever your need be, Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord. You can choose to make him your Lord if you haven't done so right now. But whatever your need be, let us know what it is uh, while we stand and sing.